You're listening to All Things Video, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the past and charting the future of the online video ecosystem. You're listening to All Things Video. I'm your host, James Creech, and today's guest is Matt Geelan, co-founder and CEO of Electric Monster. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on again. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, this is actually a special round two. I think the last time we chatted was five and a half years ago, if you can believe it, September 2016. Lord. A lot has changed since then. Yeah, no kidding. I guess I was uh, just starting Little Monster at that point. You were. Yeah, we got a little preview into the, the early business. And I encourage anyone who hasn't checked out that episode to go back and they can hear your full origin story. But um, yeah, like I teased, we've got a lot of ground to cover today and um, also excited just to kind of catch up in general and hear the latest developments. Awesome. Sounds good, man. So for those who aren't familiar, maybe give a quick introduction, um, you know, about yourself and, and how we got to Little Monster initially, and then we'll talk about some of your more recent projects. Cool. Um, so been in the online video industry for probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 years. Uh, ran uh, programming and audience development at a company called Driver Digital, and then at Frederator for about three and a half years, uh, and then wrote uh, a number of like think pieces that we published on TubeFilter all around kind of building audiences and brands on YouTube. And that led to um, me launching my agency, Little Monster, and Little Monster is alive and well. And for uh, over six years now, I think. And um, we're in the business of helping uh, brands build audiences on YouTube. And we do that through consulting, operations, production, uh, and a little bit of uh, paid media. Fantastic. Well, I've been privileged to know you, Matt, for, gosh, I don't know how long, maybe eight years at this point. And um, I think you're being humble, but your claim to fame uh, initially was, you know, the whole reverse engineering the YouTube algorithm um, think piece that you wrote for TubeFilter. And of course, you've spoken quite a bit at VidCon, a number of other conferences. So um, for a long time, you know, you've, you always come to mind for me as the go-to expert when it comes to YouTube optimization, channel management, and audience development. So um, awesome to see that business continue to grow and you know you kind of practically applying those things that you're studying and researching you know on behalf of brands and other publisher accounts thank you i appreciate that um yeah you know we were able to apply what we knew about the recommendation system and about audiences on youtube um to you know a, a number of big brands and, and even you know smaller brands i think you know one of the uh, you know more uh, interesting aspects of running a consultancy is you get a lot of um, you know inbound of like really unique properties and, and people who are really fascinated by the platform and so you know we've worked on everything from you know movie clips and when they were like 150 million monthly views up to a billion and then you know we worked with a pond builder uh, the world's premier builder of ponds uh, early on helping them build their YouTube channel so. You know, we've seen a lot uh, over the years and you know, continue to study the recommendation system and you know, read the, the white papers that Google and YouTube publish about that recommendation system and kind of marrying the understanding of the architecture with the data, with kind of the human side, the more artistic side of the platform to you know, have very repeatable success. Um, and it was really cool now with Electric Monster, you know, being able to apply that to brands we own. And so we sold Little Monster in March of 21 mm -hmm. uh, to a company that I co-founded uh, with a few other individuals um, and uh, began acquiring channels. Amazing. So tell us about that. Tell us about your co-founders and what was the inspiration behind saying, hey, we're doing this already on behalf of other people. You know, let's take our own medicine and uh, apply it on, on brands that we own. Tell us about that journey. Absolutely. So, um, you know, probably back in 2018, 2019, I met a, a group of folks uh, who were trying to launch a fund uh, for films. Uh, and uh, they wanted to have a, a viewpoint on the digital landscape as part of the business they were building. And so and they brought me in, they met with me and, you know, they took a look at our, our numbers and our track record and said, you know, you know if you owned some of these brands, um, you know, this would be an incredibly valuable business. And so, you know, we began working on uh, fundraising and, um, you know, the model and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, get the, get the business launched in March. And since then, you know, we've acquired, um, I think we've done six transactions in our largest acquisition to date. 
uh, was React. And then our other acquisitions are really in the kids and family space. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're starting to see a lot of uh, success with the, the properties and the growth, especially on the new content. And you know, seeing the, the methodology uh, prove itself out again on properties we actually own, uh, entertaining, you know, millions and millions of people on a monthly basis is uh, super cool. That's awesome. Let's talk a little bit more about the React Media deal, right? Formerly Fine Brothers Entertainment. Tell us about um, how that deal came about. Yeah, so that was actually once we uh, closed on the fundraising and sold a monster. Um, you know, I reached out to the CEO at the time um, uh, within the first week. Said, "Hey, um, really interested in React? Can we talk?" And so, you know, kind of the process developed from there and. And it's a, you know, it's a legendary brand. It's one of the kind of the earliest like media brands on the platform. Um, it's been around for, uh, you know, quite some time and it's always been something that I've been aware of. And, you know, I knew the brothers, um, you know, over years of going to conferences and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we were, we were very excited about the acquisition for a host of reasons, of course, the, the brands they own and, and that sort of thing, but also because of the capabilities and the reach that React and the associated brands have on other platforms as well. You know, bringing the skill set and uh, properties into our organization uh, off the YouTube platform, uh, which, you know, creates the opportunity for, uh, you know, future acquisitions in our current, current portfolio uh, to, you know, build audiences on the other platforms uh, as well. And that's, uh, you know, a super exciting aspect of that acquisition. That's awesome. And it, I think what's neat about it is it's a, an example of, you know, these two very early YouTubers, as you mentioned, right, Vinny and Rafi Fine, who built a business, but also thought of it as building a production company, right? They had office space, <clears throat> great production facilities in Burbank, um, close to 100 people, if I remember correctly, right? I'm, I'm kind of guesstimating here, but you would know better than me. Um, and then they brought in leadership, right? Like Mark Kutzfed did a great job kind of building out that team and having a vision for well, how do we take this beyond a single talent, right? And build a media brand, build media properties around this format or this type of content that they're creating. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very uncommon, I think, for that perspective in this space, because so many people, you know, approach YouTube channels as like a direct extension of themselves. And, you know, from from very early on, uh, Benny and Rafi, you know, really kind of set it up to be uh, a media company and a digital first media company. And so, um, you know, being able to come in and acquire it, when we did, um, it was a fantastic opportunity. And, uh, you know, we closed right at the end of October and we're just very, very excited about um, the group that's staying with the company and, uh, you know, taking the brands forward into 2022 and beyond here. Yeah. The only real comparable example I can think of is Smosh, right? Where they kind of also set it up as, of course, there's initially um, core talent that are the identity of the brand, but over time they evolved it to, you know, get into other verticals, Smosh Gaming, they have like food and lifestyle content now, and then expanding the roster of talent. So it was more around building the Smosh brand and, and not about emphasizing as much any individual personality. And, you know, obviously the Fine Brothers and React Media kind of followed a similar blueprint. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, you know, I think there's, you know, a few others out there um, that are, you know, varying degrees of that. Like, you know, Good Mythical Morning is certainly very um, Rhett and Link, uh, you know, focused and, and Stevie focused, but it's a brand unto itself. Like if you say Good Mythical Morning, it stands for something, you know, beyond just, you know, Rhett and Link. And then there's stuff um, like, uh, you know, how it should have ended or cinema sins mm -hmm. or, you know, Babish culinary universe where you're starting to see creators really set themselves up um, with, uh, you know, viewing themselves more as brands, more as media companies, you know, having an understanding of kind of uh, the, the ability to get stuck in the, the influencer mentality or, or framework and how, you know, that prevents issues from fully realizing the value of, uh, you know, the company that you have, have really built, uh, you know, going off of a, a personality or an influencer. Uh, it's a great start, but, you know, how do we, uh, you know, create the opportunity for uh, these influencers to expand beyond that, or these media properties that uh, maybe are predominantly run by an influencer or feature a particular, you know, set of uh, talent. You know, how do we create that framework for them where 
uh, we can expand beyond that and not, you know, potentially suffer from some of the same uh, issues where, you know, creators can rise very fast and then also fall very fast depending mm-hmm. on, you know, the adi- audience and the platforms and that sort of thing. And even the burnout issues, right? Of oh yeah, big shouldering time. all of that on your own is is a is a tall order. So having a team around you, building a brand identity that's larger than any single individual, hopefully relieves a little bit of that pressure. So yeah, definitely a good model going forward. Uh, you know, I think we're also now seeing a number of other portfolio strategies emerge among digital brands or publishers, from you know the Vox acquisition of Group Nine, which had already rolled the Pop Sugar, to recurrent ventures acquiring Donut Media. What's different about the electric monster approach compared to some of these other, you know, digital publisher strategies? Yeah, um, you know, in in regards to the the donut media acquisition, I think that was brought into a portfolio where there largely wasn't YouTube presence, and um, they're they're very rightfully looking at Matt Levine to um, help those brands really establish a more robust YouTube presence because they're. I believe they're they're mostly magazine or, or TV brands, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at uh, recurrent. Um, and you know, Matt uh, started at Awesomeness, I believe, uh, and then built Donut over years into you know a great media property um, and working with a lot of on-screen talent. And so, you know, I think uh, that's a that's a really interesting uh, acquisition there. Though I don't know what their plans are in terms of like future acquisitions. Uh, you know, as it pertains to the the Vox and, and Group Nine um, aspect of it, you know, I, I feel like those are uh, smaller or very large scale uh, you know, roll ups of very specific properties that have like an off platform presence. And you know, while some of them do you know quite well on YouTube, that's a, a very small part of their revenue, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I think we're we're pretty unique in the space um, in regards to um, you know having certainly a, a kids vertical, but also very much looking into general entertainment from a, a roll up and acquisition strategy, but then also adding in the the layer of optimization and you know operational support that you know I've uh, you know had the privilege to to be a leader at a company like Federator, and then certainly from a, a consulting perspective. Um, you have had a major role in uh, over the years. Very cool. So you mentioned, you know, a couple of times now, kids and family emphasis. What uh, jumps out at you about that vertical, or why why are you so focused on you know building out a presence in that that lane? You know, I think from like a portfolio perspective, um, we're probably going to end up somewhere in the neighborhood of like uh, seventy thirty general entertainment versus kids. Um, between that and like fifty fifty, uh, and I think you know the kid space is super fascinating. Certainly, as a father of two of my own, it's one that. Uh, is uh, very relevant to me as my uh, my son is a my six year old is a very big fan of uh, Chad and uh, V with Spy Ninjas, um, and uh, you know told me the other day that he I, I put him in the Oculus for the first time and he, like lost his mind. And the first <laughs> thing he did when it was over, he said, "Can we?" Um, you know, I want to play a game where I'm like fighting the hackers, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh my god." And like immediately my brain starts spiraling like, oh, Chad and V should definitely do a VR game. And, da, da, da. and it's like, um, you know, it's a, a, a very exciting time in that way uh, and very relevant to me from, you know, uh, having kids perspective, but also just from like a media company perspective, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the moon bug exit to, to candle uh, yeah. certainly jumps out. But certainly we were, you know, all systems go on that. Um, you know, prior to that announcement and, you know, looking at what Moonbug was doing, um, you know, we certainly saw, you know, its expansion and growth of those brands off of the YouTube platform. Um, and so, you know, one of our uh, kind of core uh, theses was like, well, if we can take, you know, kids properties that are smaller, right, in the five to 2,500 million range where you know, their acquisitions were like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions to billions of views. Um, and scale those properties up, right? That's a really interesting value proposition, not just from like a YouTube ad revenue standpoint, but also from a licensing and merchandising and, uh, you know, potential syndication, right? Like when we talk about like open platforms for publishing right now in the kids space, there's basically just YouTube. Um, And it's definitely an area that uh, there's, uh, you know, potential for a competitor in the same way that, you know, YouTube, Facebook, um, Insta, TikTok, and Snap are competing for people's time and attention in various different ways and, and in and around video. 
um, you know, I think the, the same opportunity is there for kids, um, although it is one that's significantly more difficult to open up. Uh, you know, if you saw the, you know, Instagram kids announcement where mm -hmm. they, you know, decided to suspend that, but very ill fated, right? I mean, public backlash yeah. from the get go, which, you know, look, it's a that's a challenging um, uh, topic to, to cover, but it does seem like given the negative sentiment around Facebook and Instagram at the moment, uh, perhaps people feel like, well, this is not this is not the place that this initiative should be coming from. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that's a generally what the kind of the consensus that came out. I think Instagram came to that consensus where, you know, I think they readily came out and said, look, we need to do more research um, and kind of, you know, uh, build the trust with the audience again, um, you know, before we take on this venture. And, um, and I think that's a, a fair assessment uh, and it would be, um, you know, uh, similarly interesting, like from, uh, you know, a TikTok perspective. Uh, with its uh, rapid uh, growth in, in user base and certainly the, the, you know, the opportunity for the immediacy of content uh, that, you know, we see kids, you know, absolutely love and um, be, uh, you know, very engaged with. Um, so, you know, the, the kids space is one that, you know, we have, uh, you know, four or five properties in and are, you know, stay, you know, excited about. We think the recent YouTube announcement around, Really, their five core pillars of of quality is a, a great step, um, and uh, you know one that our, our content lives up to, and uh, are just really excited about the future of uh, kids' content uh, and digital video. Yeah, I mean the appetite for digital kids' content is enormous, right? You look at the top uh, YouTube channels by subscriber base or monthly viewership, and for a long time it was gaming and music, but very quickly, you know, we've seen kids' content skyrocket to the top of that list, and Coco Melon part of Moonbug obviously was was dominant there, but now it's transcending YouTube and it's ending up on Netflix and kind of in the streaming wars, there's this greater and greater interest or competitive, uh, you know, uh, conflict over um, trying to acquire more kids content. So I think that's a good bet. Earlier, you were hinting that maybe we need a new platform for kids content. Do you think that will come in the form of a dedicated social platform or is it going to be more like a traditional you know, streaming video on demand, like a Netflix for kids um, service. Yeah, I mean, I think there's opportunity for an open platform. Um, although, you know, at the same time, I think YouTube uh, recognized uh, back in the uh, Elsa Gate days that just a completely unregulated open platform was a, a bad move. And if you look at like the scale of the investment needed in order to build something like that up, to ensure you're abiding by like regulations and you know creating a safe environment, uh, it's a pretty massive investment to undertake. So you know I think it'll probably be more in the vein of you know the Netflix Kids, the um, oh uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but the um, they rate uh, kids properties on oh, like, Common what's... Sense Media launched a platform called Sensical, I think. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, look like that, where where it is a more curated experience, because you know that's uh, that's how you keep kids safe and you know keep uh, uh, the the content for being advertiser friendly as well, yeah. because that's what keeps all of this afloat and running. Big time. As a father, what are you most excited about for the world that your kids will grow up in? So I was thinking about it the other day when I put this kid, uh, my my son Huck, uh, in the VR. And I was watching him play VR wireless on the Oculus 2. And he playing Beat Saber and jumping around, dancing around, dodging the blocks and stuff. And I was like, when I was his age, the coolest thing in the world, this was like pre-Game Boy, right? It was like when there would be a single game on one of those like little handheld things, mm. right? It would be like Tech Mobile. It was like, you know, worse than 8-bit, right? It's just like absolute garbage. It compared to today's stuff, but like at the time, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I was just sitting there thinking like, oh my God, what is going to happen 40 years from now, right? Like I'm 30 or 30, you know, two years from now, like where is technology going to go? And like, that's fascinating from like a long-term uh, perspective and like what the potential is for, uh, you know, both, you um, hardware and software as it pertains to, you know, delivering entertainment experiences for uh, people of, you know, essentially all ages and what the, the possibilities are there. 
yeah, I can't, I don't think we can even imagine it at this point, right? I have a friend, um, Parker Jones, who you probably know, who's in Korea at the moment, right? So he just flew over and did the 10 day quarantine. And he said Oculus 2 is literally what saved him because he actually felt like he was getting a chance to travel outside his hotel room <laughs> during this <laughs> 10 days in captivity. So from your six year old to, you know, my friend, uh, halfway across the world who's using it to combat loneliness in the midst of, you know, the, the pandemic circumstances we're all battling. It's pretty wild what it's able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Uh, let's talk about YouTube shorts, right? I mean, obviously short form video, we're familiar with it. We, we, we lived through the Vine days and now it's made this massive resurgence through TikTok and algorithm discovery that's now being adapted to YouTube through shorts and Instagram with reels and Snapchat with spotlight. But how, you know, since you focus a lot of time and expertise within YouTube, how is shorts changing the platform? Yeah, it's changing it in a non-significant way. I mean, like first and foremost with, you know, a huge percentage of viewership on the platform as a whole coming from mobile. I think the last time I heard a stat, it was like 60% or something, though they are increasing quite a bit on TV screens, um, which we're seeing across the board and is like very valuable and very powerful. Um, but it's certainly having an impact on mobile viewership um, where, you know, just, you know, billions upon billions of monthly views are happening, daily views. Um, and what is essentially happening is those shorts are taking up impressions from uh, the long form content, right? Where when it's put in the uh, homepage feed or the browse feed, um, you know, those impressions can't go to, to long form content, but, uh, you know, Outside of that, I think it's um, certainly fascinating from uh, an industry level perspective in the sense of like, I can't think of a faster, more robust product that YouTube has rolled out uh, in a decade, mm -hmm. right? Like they launched and scaled up shorts where they say they just passed 5 trillion views or something yeah. in a year, right? 15 months. And if that doesn't tell you um, one, how much TikTok ate into their, their viewership and time on site, or at the very least, how, um, you know, uh, scary it was that TikTok could do that. Um, like that's huge. Like we haven't seen an outside force move YouTube in that way in a very long time. I mean, there was like some, you know, stuff around like go 90. And then there was the thing out of, uh, San Francisco that the guys launched, um, uh, where it was like uh, exclusive content from YouTube influencers for like three days or something. Oh and yeah, was, Vessel. Vessel, yeah. Yep. Like there was some YouTube response to like those things, but mm. like nothing at the scale of like what's happened sure. with TikTok and YouTube. Well, and you um, have to imagine, right? You, you track TikTok's growth and their rate at which they hit a billion monthly active users or the fact that they surpassed Google last year in terms of um, web search activity being the number, you know, number one most visited website. Like that's wild. That has to be impacting your, your business planning if you're sitting over at YouTube trying to figure out, hey, what's the next thing that we're going to do? And you're quickly watching Instagram and Snapchat aping the TikTok features. It's got to feel like a pretty tectonic shift. Yeah, big time. Um, and it's all video. Like these other platforms didn't really start with video, right? Like uh, Twitter tried to get into video and fail because it's a copy based platform, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook, you know, started out as like picture sharing and text sharing and link sharing. And like they've come a long way with video, but it's taken years and years and years and years because it's not a primarily video based platform. Yeah. Right? Instagram started with photos, Snapchat started with photos and like, yeah, they're making moves into video and inroads into videos, but like um, TikTok was video first, right? So it's like one of the first platforms that isn't like doing this as an add-on to their core service, um, but really step up and challenge YouTube in a major way. And then, you know, what it says about like mobile audiences, um, I remember five, six years ago, we were talking about like, don't film anything in vertical, it looks terrible. Like, <laughs> yeah. It took YouTube, what, like three years to be like, oh, we can shift the size of the player on the website, which was mm -hmm. like revolutionary and mind blowing. Yeah. And like, now it's like, well, of course, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? Like, um, but like, you know, it's, it's completely changed the art form in that way where like the primary filming mode now is vertical, you know? Yeah. And not only that, I think a lot about the fact that uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, to a great extent, 
started as a social network, right? A means to reflect your social graph. Whereas YouTube was primarily a, a content platform. Like sure, people lumped it in with a kind of version one or 2.0 social networks, but it wasn't really about sure, you know, I, Matt and I know each other, so I'm gonna go follow your content on YouTube. Not everyone's a creator, not, not everything worked that way. On Facebook or Instagram in the early days it was all about sharing pictures with my friends. What are they up to? How do I keep in touch with them and see what they're doing? Increasingly, those platforms have all shifted to being content platforms. How do I follow celebrities or influencers that I really admire, or even brands that create really cool, inspiring content? Or, you know, there's these, you know, breakout viral success stories that other people look to, to replicate. So I think we're moving more and more to a contract centric world. And the ways that we communicate now are perhaps a little inherently less social than they were five, 10 years ago, right? We're congregating in messaging apps like Telegram or Discord or, um, you know, uh, WhatsApp. And it's less of an emphasis of like, I'm going to go on Facebook and update my friends or post on their wall. That, that just, those notions have like totally gone out the window. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a, a really fascinating distinction that I don't think has been um, fully made or um, appreciated just yet in terms of like those differences where it's like, what is the motivation of the viewer here, right? Is the viewer here to be entertained, to learn or to connect, mm -hmm. right? And like, you know, in, in so many ways, like even on your like personal profiles, like um, there are people that are, you know, going to engage with it um, to, to connect or to be entertained or to learn something from you, right? Um, and in the same way, like, you know, uh, a Discord, um, you know, that uh, can be looked at in, in all of those ways, um, but it's primarily like, a, you know, a, a conversational platform mm -hmm. where, you know, um, a YouTube platform, like, yeah, there's comments and that sort of thing, but like, you know, 95% of viewers, maybe even higher than that, like don't engage in that way at all. It's really more of a passive experience um, in, in so many ways. Uh, that's really, you know, uh, an interesting time in terms of um, what is the purpose of these platforms uh, from a starting place? How are they transitioning? And, and to your point, like, how are they utilizing content to, to do that? Yeah. Another thing I wanted to get your perspective on, right? We're in the midst of this really interesting time where capital markets are hot, right? There's a lot of M&A activity. You're out there as a buyer, right, of uh, these brands, publishers, or these, you know, these creator driven content companies, uh, which is a relatively new phenomenon. Like sure you had acquisitions or some sort of maybe roll-up strategy in and among creative talent in the past, um, but it, it just looks and feels so much different today that you can actually finally acquire a YouTube channel outright. Whereas, you know, before those deals weren't really being done 10 years ago, that they were being, you know, their ad sales rights were given away to MCNs, but they weren't necessarily being um, acquired and owning the long tail viewership. And then you've got all these business models like Spotter, which is saying, hey, we'll buy your catalog out. And, and that way you have some additional liquidity if you want to invest in future content or if you know, you're looking to stabilize income. You've got Jelly Smack, which is kind of making similar overtures now to saying we want to support creators, but we're looking at maybe buying catalog or doing some other interesting kind of um, uh, financial modeling around that. What, is, what are the, the characteristics you look for when evaluating a channel that you might want to work with? And what is your overall take on the, the broader m a market for this type of content at the moment? So in terms of the characteristics of like what we look for in channel, I would say kind of first and foremost, um, you know, uh, brand safe and brand friendly, right? Um, advertising is kind of the, the backbone of digital video. Uh, we got to make sure that the properties that we do acquire um, are going to be capable of, you know, serving ads on it. And that doesn't mean like, you know, we can't be edgy and we can't, you know, push boundaries here and there. It just means like, got to do it in, in a manner in which is not going to alienate advertisers um, where, you know, with uh, you know, various influencer content, I think less so these days, but, um, you know, certainly at the you know, peak influencer on YouTube type thing, pre TikTok, that was a big issue, right? Um, and in part uh, led to the, the adpocalypse. Um, so that's kind of the, the first checkbox. The next one is that it's uh, not talent dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not opposed to working with talent or working with influencer in this way. Um, but certainly if the vast majority of the viewership on a channel is 
uh, viewership for an individual, then it's going to be something that's going to be very difficult for us to kind of wrap our arms around and have like downside protection if something mm -hmm. happens to that person or they want to leave or they're done, that sort of yeah. thing. And so, you know, that's that's another thing that we take you know extremely seriously. Um, you know, then we're looking at things like. Um, what is its current reach? What are its various revenue streams? Are we able to kind of leverage some of our abilities around licensing, syndication, and merchandising to, um, you know, get the brand generating revenue in, in other areas? Um, and uh, then how does it fit into our portfolio, right? Is it complementary? Is this something that, you know, it'll be easy for us to do brand integrations into uh, and kind of all those other factors that, you know, one would do in terms of, uh, looking at uh, a property on YouTube in terms of its potential for revenue. Uh, and then in the, the market in general, like um, there's just not that many people out there buying YouTube channels. I mean, mm. you know, Moonbug, I think bought oh, what, like a dozen maybe. Um, and uh, you know, they really bought like these huge big assets. And yep. I think the primary focus was in the licensing, syndication and merchandising world um, as opposed to like scaling them up on YouTube. Whereas, you know, we really think, um, you know, given our know-how and industry experience, um, we want to start with a, a step one of scaling up on YouTube, or at the very least, you know, bringing the, the muscle around syndication to other social platforms to bear on the, the properties. Very cool. Yeah, it, it does seem like um, some, some bigger plays have been made, but, the, the, you know, there's this market of smaller or mid-sized channels that are a good fit for future growth or additional income streams. So, you know, maybe we'll see this model continue to catch on as um, creators look to build media brands and look for options for liquidity as they think about kind of what's next in their career plan. So um, thinking about the future, what's coming next? If you had to make a few predictions for the future of the creator economy broadly, what would they be? Oh, man. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't hit the, you know, NFT crypto web 3.0 buzzwords. So if we could just go ahead and check all those off. <laughs> there we um, go. I would appreciate it. Um, but no, like, you know, that is that is the future in some form or another, maybe not selling like JPEGs of an ape, but like, um, you know, the, the idea of influencers in virtual and digital environments and people spending more time in digital environments, um, I think is where the, the hugest opportunity is. Like, you know, I think when they were doing Google Glass, what was that, 10 years ago? Yeah, it feels like it. Um, like the first thing when I saw that, I'm, I'm a big history buff and it goes back to a host of things. One, and I um, was really into the video game. Uh, God, what was it? It was Rome, I think. Um, and I always played as, uh, uh, or played Civ 2 a lot. And um, then, you know, I was, I was number one in the world at a game called The Age of Mythology, where it was like a bunch of Greek um, gods versus Norse gods versus Egyptian gods. And it's part of the Age of Empires franchise. Um, so I've always been, been very into like the history of like Rome and Greece and that sort of thing. And like, I saw Google Glass, I was like, oh my God, imagine if you had like a tour guide that would lead you through the Roman form ruins and you could overlay what it probably looked like and see, you know, people walking in togas and that kind of thing. Like, and like, imagine if you're the company or the influencer that is able to do that. And it's like, you know, it's 10 bucks to take a tour of the Roman forum using virtual reality or something like that, right? Like, so, you know, in that way, I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity for content creation in that space because that space has not a lot, right? Um, it's, it's not super advanced. It's kind of like, uh, you know, an opportunity for a very large gold rush where, um, you know, you're creating the, the land as you go. And that's fascinating to me. Very cool. Yeah, I think um, we're going to see more decentralization, more creator ownership, you know, to the, the Web3 um, mission statement. Uh, and uh, you know, absolutely the opportunities to leverage new technologies like VR, AR filters to create these more interactive content experiences um, are coming, right? I mean, we've seen, you know, hints of that over time, of more and more gravitation towards live video. We're seeing more integrations with commerce and shoppable um, social content now. And it feels like, yeah, that next leap is coming with the Web3 movement and then the potential to layer in AR, VR. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. 
what do you want your ultimate impact or legacy to be? As you think about, you know, the work that you're doing in the digital media space, what is, you know, your focus on uh, what you want to leave behind? Ooh, that's a heavy question, man. I'm trying to just get through this pandemic at the moment. <laughs> like, Fair enough. Um, you know, the uh, I haven't had a moment in the last several years to you know sit and contemplate uh, that aspect of it. But you know, I think uh, like generally speaking, high level speaking, like would love to build entertainment brands that people love um, and care about, and uh, you know feel a part of and feel a part of the success. And so. You know, in in that way, I think um, uh, that is the the life mission uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, what motivates me, what gets me out of bed every day, what I find to be the most fascinating is like, you know, trying to figure out the two unsolvable pro- uh, puzzles of the world, which is like, you know, human beings uh, in general, and then also these, um, you know, black boxes, these platforms. How do they work? Um, what is the the machine thinking about? Because um, that's that's fascinating to me in terms of like problem solving and and puzzle solving. So yeah, I'd say that's that's kind of the the lifelong dream and goal. Do you think we're seeing a shift towards more transparency from social platforms? You know, YouTube is publishing these white papers and you know releasing these video series where they're talking about inputs to their algorithm. And sure, they won't be uh, explicit or share source code or anything like that, but they're kind of giving creators an idea of uh, how they're thinking about the platform. Great example, you know, is YouTube. I, you know, they're probably the most transparent where they're um, in fact piloting features now where they're saying, hey, this is search activity that's unfulfilled today. And so if you're a creator, this is what your audience wants and we can help you kind of design content around that. Um, do you feel like we're, we're seeing a shift towards more of a conversation and transparency with, with the greater creative community? Oh, I think generally, yes. I mean, you know, the the value proposition of these platforms is largely like build your business on us or you can build your business on us, invest in us, um, you know, with uh, with your time, with your content, you know, with your uh, career and, and income. And so, you know, in order to do that, they have to hold up their end of that bargain and create a environment uh, that, um, you know, uh, has some level of stability and, and part of the way you create that stability is by being transparent with you know what you're trying to do what your goals are and and what you're looking for and so yeah I think you know to an extent um, but certainly not anything of uh, you know um, uh, like a full transparency or anything like that and yeah. I think part of it is you know pressure from you know creators and businesses of like hey you want me to invest here well I need to know what I'm investing in uh, and how it works if I want to build a stable business. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously there's still a lot of work to be done, right? Some platforms have just started publishing transparency reports as of last year, right? OnlyFans is a good example of that. Um, I think Twitch and Amazon are, are fairly early in their transparency efforts also. And people have legitimate questions about, you know, we're spending a lot of time and money and creators are pouring their creative capital into these platforms. Uh, we deserve to know, you know, legal implications of, of what's going on on the, co- on the platform, what type of content um, is being demonetized or actioned against. Um, and increasingly, uh, there's a bit of a backlash to these web 2.0 giants, the social media players like a YouTube or an Instagram, because they've kind of made it essential to, if you're a creator, to exist on their platform. And initially the thought was, okay, well, I'll, I'll leverage the scale to build up an audience quickly and then try and you know, migrate off. But the, um, the inertia is so strong that people struggle to leave the gravitational pull that is these platforms. And some of them, which might help you build an audience quickly, TikTok is probably the greatest example, don't pay very well, right? Even the TikTok Creator Fund, which is billions of dollars, it's a little unclear exactly what the ultimate dollar figure is, but certainly billions globally. Um, and these massive creators are earning, you know, a single digit, double digit, you know, hundreds of dollars, like not, not real figures that they can build an income around. So um, I guess we still have a long way to go is, is the summary. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, you can't build a business on a three cent RPM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, uh, obviously not. Um, I don't know if you were, you're partially referencing Hank's video the other day. Um, I don't know if you saw that one, but it was. Uh, well, it's you know. uh, pretty aggressive, right? What is it called? TikTok sucks. 
Yeah. So dot 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 TikToks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but accurate, right? Sure. Like, and you know, maybe stuff that they're trying to figure out on their end. And you know, I, I think he makes a point in there. Like, there's so many people, these organizations that do want to help creators, that do want to help media companies. That like, it's important that we be mindful of that and um, you know, empathetic to them and, and help them. And part of the way that you know we help them is by making our voices heard around like what we're dissatisfied about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not fully sold on the decentralization angle. Um, I'm not really sold much at all. Uh, in no small part because like, if you just look at the skill set it takes to be a media company, right? Like an individual is going to have a real, real, real hard time uh, hiring all those skill sets uh, or developing themselves. Right. And so like you're, you're asking a lot in, in a lot of different ways. I'm not saying it's not possible and you can find some great people and, you know, maybe great management and that sort of thing. Um, but like, you know, the, the Mr. Beast empire is the exception, not the rule. Mm-hmm. Right. Like uh, it's real difficult to do it. And, um, you know, it's real difficult to do it on, on platforms that are not like, you know, very firm, solid foundational type platforms of like, you know, look, the biggest knock on TikTok is like, you can have a video, you know, or, or video, every video you put up on TikTok does a hundred thousand plus views. And then the next day it's like 300. And yeah. it's like, how, you, how, what am I supposed to do here? And it's like early, you know, Google search days and uh, early YouTube algorithm shift days where like you'd be doing 10 million monthly views one day. And then the next day it's just like, mm, nope, you are down to five views a day. Sorry. Goodbye. Rising tides, you know, float all ships. And it's like, okay. You know, but if you look at the YouTube platform, it's been very, very stable for the better part of five years. Um, you know, once they shifted to to watch time, it's largely kind of, uh, you know, stayed humming along with no, you know, severe radical shifts. Yeah. Well, as we think about, you know, the white space out there, so for all the entrepreneurs or, or uh, aspiring creatives that are listening in, uh, what do you recommend if, if you were starting a business in the media and entertainment space today, where should people look? Are there content verticals that are unfulfilled? Is, are there tools for the creator economy that need to be built out? Um, what are the solutions that if you weren't focused 100% on building Electric Monster, you would be you know, telling people they should go pay attention to? Oh, I mean, good question. Um, you know, I think from a, a tool set perspective, um, you know, there's some things that I think could help um, creators better understand their audiences. Um, and I think as well within YouTube's power to create these or to, um, uh, you know, for third parties to build on top of it. But I don't think there's anything like really revolutionary. And, you know, maybe that's a, you know, a, a viewpoint um, that's informed by, uh, I think, what I think is a relatively simple approach to YouTube, uh, which is like focusing on the core value proposition of what your audience is there for um, and, you know, delivering them each week what they want to see and what they've indicated they want to see through the data. And so like, there's some kind of like marginal tool sets around that that I think would be helpful um, in the broader kind of creator economy. You know, I think the the number one thing that, creators to to build businesses if you want to build a business you want to build a media company uh they you know need around them is um you know great business support um yeah i think we need you know far better outreach and inroads into america's universities where you know the the current feeder system is largely into traditional media um or into other industries and our industry is like 15 years old right digital video like Think about the film industry at 15 it was like the longest film was like three minutes right? and that was like blew people's minds <laughs> so like you know that's we need infrastructure at this point i know that might sound odd but like we need human infrastructure and outreach and uh to bring great people into the industry and, and let them grow and let them grow their their understanding yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it not just infrastructure, but education, right? You think about some of these yep. institutions of higher learning. And I went to film school at USC uh, a little over a decade ago. And 
Um, it was primarily focused on how do we turn out people to make big blockbuster Hollywood, you know, films. And, yeah. and that business has shifted dramatically. We produce a lot fewer films these days than we did before. There was very little emphasis on television. And obviously we're in this like golden age of TV, which is amazing. Um, and of course, I'm sure USC has shifted or adapted much more since I've been there. But there was virtually little to no uh, education around digital content, web series, YouTube, anything like that. And I would suspect that a lot of people graduating from USC film school today work in digital content. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, even those legacy institutions are changing and, and the infrastructure requirements um, are, are kind of across the board to support the, the new media landscape. Yeah, absolutely. And then just from like a time perspective, you know, we're, you know, in digital video eating up more and more of the, you know, uh, ad spend from from TV and from other kind of traditional advertising um, modes. And that just takes time. It takes time for that to shift. It takes time for, you know, people of our, um, you know, age group to move into positions of being, um, you know, leaders within their companies that, uh, you know, do the, the ad buying and, and kind of have a generational like shift in tone and like, that's before we even begin talking about like government regulation where we got 70 year olds asking like Mark Zuckerberg uh, <laughs> How do you about like his, yeah, or like his Google phone. And he's like, what? Like, why is Apple? Or like, how, why are you? What are we doing about the Finsta question? accounts, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, it's a little scary sometimes how much politicians are out of touch with the digital age, but you know, maybe when people who are 70 and 80 stop running for election office, then younger generations will get a chance. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I could probably talk to you about that for a whole another yeah, that's a different, polling that's podcast because I know you're also a politics junkie, but we'll, we'll square uh, people yeah. for today. Uh, yeah. Matt, where can people find out more about you and more about Electric Monster? Yeah, they can check out electricmonster.com. Uh, certainly follow me on Twitter at Matt Keelan um, or, uh, you know, search for Little Monster Media Co. Right on. Well, Matt, it's always so much fun getting to chop it up with you. So thanks for spending some time today uh, to talk a little bit more about the latest and greatest stuff that you're working on and uh, just kind of the future of the creator economy in general. It's always fun to kind of dive in. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great catching up with you. Thanks for tuning in. I'm James Creech, and this has been another edition of All Things Video. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll share and subscribe for new episodes. See you next time.